Astronomy Cast, episode 57 for Monday, October 8th, 2007. Jupiter's Moons. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hi, Pamela. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Good. All right. This week is going to be a continuation from last week. So last week we talked about Jupiter and we could sense right in the beginning that it was going to be too much show to handle. So we thought we'd split it in two and handle Jupiter last week and its moons this week. So we've covered the Jupiter side of it. This week we'll do the moons and let's just get right into it. Pamela, how did we learn that Jupiter had moons? Well, Galileo looked up. Uh, That's the snarky answer. The more fleshed out answer is telescopes finally came into existence in the 1600s and Galileo was one of the ones who pointed out hey we can use these to detect the enemy ships coming in from a distance and then he also went off and realized wait we can also use this device to look up at the sky. That amazes me that didn't occur to anybody I wonder if that's just sort of the way the story's been told to this point because I can just imagine someone with one of these telescopes going huh I can look over there and I'll look at the moon well, the problem is that we can only say for certain things that people bothered to write down. Yeah, yeah. It's a history thing. There are arguments that other people discovered Galileo's moons at about the same time. For instance, the German astronomer Simus Marius claimed to have seen the moons around the same time as Galileo, but he didn't write it down. He didn't publish his observations. And I guess if you're one of the more well-respected people of the day, it's almost like it's a public relations thing. And he won the the battle. He won the battle. And so he proved to the world that he knew what he was seeing. He documented it. He kept a proper observing journal. He did everything right. And he saw the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callista. And he documented their motions. And this was about the same time that the world was getting ready to get set on its head with Kepler's discoveries of the laws of planetary motion. This was after people had been looking at the Copernican model of the solar system with the sun in the center. And here Galileo is observing, wait, not everything goes around the sun. Not everything goes around the earth. We have things going around the sun. We have things going around the earth, the moon. And now we also have things going around Jupiter. And so this was like the first time that anyone had seen anything orbiting something else. It was completely revolutionary. The world was still ruled in large part by the Greek philosophers. There was the idea that the sphere was the perfect form and anything in the heavens had to be a sphere. The music of the spheres, it, this, this idea just kept cropping up over and over and over again. Even Copernicus's idea of the sun being at the center of the solar system was based on his ideal that Apollo was a more fitting god to have in the center with the, the sun worship and Apollo having been the driver of the chariot of the sun. And here Galileo is going, wait, Jupiter, not perfectly single colored sphere. It has moons. It has features. They didn't see the red spot at that time, but he looked at the moon and saw mountains on the moon. He looked at Venus, saw the phases of Venus. He was able to prove with his observations, with that telescope, beyond anyone's doubt, anyone who was willing to look at the data couldn't not believe that the earth went around the sun instead of the sun going around the earth. And so from Galileo's first observations of the moons of Jupiter, I'm sure bigger and bigger telescopes just got better and better and saw better and better views of it. Exactly. Although one of the really weird things about it was, okay, so he's off discovering Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto way back in 1610. But the next moon of Jupiter wasn't discovered until 1892, and that's when Almathea was found. And then a couple more were found in the early 1900s. There were four moons discovered between 1904 and 1914, another couple more in 38, one in 51, one in 74, another in 70, actually several in 79. And then between 1979 and 1990, there was nothing found. So like all the textbooks you and I grew up with said Jupiter has 16 moons, and we were happy with that. 
And then in 1999, we started finding them one after another in quick succession. Until today, there's over 60 moons of Jupiter known, and we're still finding them. It's a busy system. They're just small. Yeah. And so w- when did we actually reach out then and, and start to get a good look at the moons? So there were the Pioneer missions in the early 1970s, and then Voyagers 1 and Voyagers 2 in 1979. Then there was a gap until the 1990s when we had Ulysses and Cassini both take great images, and then we had Galileo hanging out there for most of the 1990s. And the majority of what we know about the details of the moon comes from the Galileo mission. Well, there's one more, too, you forgot. New Horizons just went by. New Horizons, brand new mission. Uh, It just went by and snapped a picture as well and caught one of the outer moons in the process. So... The way we're finding these moons is actually mostly ground-based. But we're getting the good pictures, the good understandings of them from sending missions out. And while Galileo is dead, there's lots of scientists who are just jumping to propose to NASA the opportunity to send another mission out to explore, in particular Europa, but the moons one more time because they're just so fascinating. Now, I've got a question. I would think that it's a bit of a paradox with Jupiter's moons because its gravity is so large. I can see how it would suck a lot of objects into orbit around it, but I could also see it just eating them. Yeah, that's actually a problem. And in fact, most of Jupiter's innermost moons are rather temporary. Uh, For instance, Almathea. It's on an orbit such that it's going around the planet faster than the planet is rotating on its own axis. And this causes tidal effects that are eventually going to cause Almathea to drop into the atmosphere of Jupiter and get consumed. Any of the moons that are so close in that they're orbiting faster than Jupiter is rotating are eventually going to get sucked in and die. But for now, it's happily getting shredded into forming a nice gossamer ring. So it's keeping us amused in the interim. Now, can you give me a a sense of time scale? Are we seeing... I don't know. It's almost like if you look at a line, you're only seeing the people who happen to be in the line at that time, right? Or like a river. You know, you're looking at the water that has to be there. Are we seeing just the moons that happen to be there right now? But what kind of time frame will it take for it to, to gobble up some of these moons or, or let them spin out away from it? I have to admit that I haven't actually seen um, the full calculation on how long it's going to take for it to mm-hmm. fall in. But we're talking millions and millions of years here. Right. But On the outer moons, we are actually seeing an effect of when we live. The outer moons of Jupiter, they're constantly getting captured by Jupiter's gravity. Some of them are, in fact, because of the way they were captured, orbiting Jupiter in the wrong direction. They're on highly inclined orbits. They're interacting with one another. And some of them are going to end up getting flung back out of the system. That's very rare but can happen. Some of them are going to get flung further into the system. And... They're still getting eaten by Jupiter. Shoemaker-Levy 9 is an example of an object that could have become a moon had its orbit been different. But because of the orbit it had, it just got eaten by Jupiter entirely. Well, so let's talk about some of the big moons. You want to start on the inside out or the outside in? Well, let's start from the inside out. And there's also one really neat thing about how they're orbiting. And that's that they're not only tidally locked to Jupiter, but they're also in sync with one another in this really neat way. The the way it works is Io's the closest one in, and then Euro- Europa, then Ganymede, then Callisto. And the inner three are synced up such that for every one time Ganymede goes out, which is the third planet from Jupiter, Europa makes two orbits. Europa is a little bit closer in, it goes around faster. And the moon Io goes around four times. So we have Io goes around four times, Europa goes around twice, Ganymede goes around once in lockstep with one another. And this actually has the effect of tweaking Io's orbit such that it's slightly eccentric. It's slightly oval-shaped instead of being a perfect circle. And because Io changes how close it is into Jupiter, it actually gets stretched in shape the equivalent of about a 30-story building. So... During the brief period that it takes this little moon to whip itself around Jupiter, 
its surface gets flexed 30 stories. And I think we talked about it in the, the tidal forces that we go up and down maybe a... A couple meters. A meter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's going up 100 meters? 100 meters. So when you think of so much smaller of an object getting flexed 100 meters in size, this is causing the moon to have a largely molten interior. And as this bulge gets pulled out, it causes this molten stuff to constantly be looking for places to escape through the surface. Now, these are not volcanoes. These are volcanoes. <laughs> Mega volcanoes. Yeah, th this is Hollywood knows volcanoes. This is the volcano that ate all of California, except we're talking about a moon. These volcanoes are spewing material up into the atmosphere of Io that Jupiter is pulling a away at a rate of, in some cases, a thousand kilograms of material just as the magnetic fields sweep across the planet during the orbit. This material that's getting pulled away from Io as it interacts with the magnetic field lines of Jupiter forms these amazing plasma streams. This triggers lightning in Jupiter's atmospheres. There is so much violence that, uh, yeah, this, this is just some science fiction horror movie waiting to happen. So let's talk about the moon itself. Like if you were standing on the surface of the moon, what, what would it look like? It would look like every cartoon version of hell you ever imagined. Everything is sulfa and silicate. It is shades of orange, shades of brown. There is lava fields everywhere. The ground is belching sulfur clouds. It's take the nastiest, smelliest part of Yellowstone National Park and make an entire moon out of it. And then make the moon covered in constantly refreshing lava. Let's talk about these volcanoes. How big and powerful are they? On average, they're about 40 kilometers across. So that's, that's big. But what they do with their size is even more spectacular. They're blowing ash and other pyroclastic materials into space 500 kilometers. So you could be 500 kilometers above the surface of Io. That's higher than the space shuttle goes. And you're still getting blasted with this material. Getting hit by lava. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> they, they actually talk about how it's snowing sulfur ash. The uh, Galilean space probe at one point was going over the poles of Io. And since the poles aren't getting tweaked by the tidal forces of Jupiter quite so much, it's at the equator that everything's getting 100 meters of deformation. They weren't expecting as much volcanism up toward the poles. And it's flying along and just gets blasted with ash snow. And uh, of course, this made all the scientists giddy, stupid, happy. Now, I've seen pictures of Iowa where you can see, like, it looks like there's a fountain going off on this on the yeah. side of Iowa. So I will link to some of that stuff on the show notes. But it's just it's just amazing. It's it's really is one of the most amazing objects in the whole solar system. Yeah, it's both terribly beautiful and terribly frightening all at once. Just the power of nature on this little moon. Now we talked about Jupiter's magnetic field and how it's causing, it accelerates particles and causes radiation. <clears throat> if you were on Io, what would that be like? Jupiter's magnetic fields get carried around with it as it rotates, and Io passes in and out of the magnetic field lines. When it's going through one of these magnetic field lines, that's when you're getting about a thousand kilograms of material, one ton of material pulled out every second and that material is getting ionized by the magnetic fields and it forms what's called a plasma torus and when that torus of material hits Jupiter's atmosphere it's carrying along electricity this electricity it, it can be 400 volts across IO an electric current of 3 million amps you're dead <laughs> it's just that simple just massive power output by the magnetic field going through this conductive material pulling it along, generating current with the motions. It's, it's a very powerful electric generator of a very deadly variety. And radiation too, though, right? You get shocked, but you also just get irradiated. You can get the radiation with particles getting accelerated. There's all sorts of different radiation. An alpha particle is just a high-speed helium atom, 
and so you can get the radiation as well.